So um, how does ADD and ADHD uh, develop? Okay. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> ADHD um, is, is said in uh, medical terminology to be the most heritable mental health illness, mental disease. Well, in this book, I make the point that to say that ADD is the most heritable mental condition is like saying that quartz is the most chewable crystal. <laughs> because it, it's, neither, it's neither a disease nor is it inherited. So go back to your childhood, you're being abused. Go back to my childhood, the wartime, persecution, all the things. As I said earlier, could we have escaped? No. Could we have changed the situation? No. Could we have fought back? No. What does the mind do when it's under too much stress? One of the things it does is automatically tunes out. So the tuning out, but this is when the brain is developing. The human brain develops from, really from in utero to adulthood, and already stresses on the mother during pregnancy can affect the brain of the child. So if a mother is very stressed or depressed during pregnancy, that kid is already at risk for ADHD later on. It's got nothing to do with genetics, or very little to do with genetics, let me put it that way. <coughs> you want a water? So, thank you. So the tuning out is simply one of these natural protections, one of these automatic, wise, um, dynamics on the part of your organism to protect yourself from stress that's too much. Now, what you have to understand again is that the human brain biologically develops under the impact of the environment. And as a, an article from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, which is the world's most prestigious child developmental organization, published in the journal of Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Academy in February 2012 pointed out, the human brain develops from in utero until adulthood, and the most important input into the physiological healthy development of the human brain is the quality of adult-child relationships. So we're relational creatures, which is again is what your work is all about, and our brain itself develops under the impact of our emotional interactions with our parents. Now, if you look at why more and more kids are being diagnosed with this condition, it can't be genetics. Genes don't change in 10 or 20 or 15 years. Now that we're seeing uh, ADHD in countries that never used to have it under the impact of corporate globalization, it's because parents are more and more stressed in this world. They're more and more isolated. And when, kids, and when parents are stressed and isolated, and by the way, we were never meant to be parented in nuclear families by a, a couple or, or perhaps a single parent. We evolved for millions of years and hundreds of thousands of years. And even in the existence of our own species, we've been here for about 150, 200,000 years. If our species existence can be measured in one hour, then until six minutes ago, we lived in small band hunter-gatherer groups where parents had support from other people where the kids were with the parents the whole day, where kids developed in the context of adult relationships. That's our need. So in this society, which is more and more stressed, and if you look at the triggers for stress, these are the research-proven triggers for stress in people. It's uncertainty, lack of information, loss of control, and conflict. Our society could not be better designed to stress people. So parents are stressed, not their own fault. Not their own fault. They're stressed. The kids are stressed. When the ki parents are stressed, you can measure the kids' stress hormone levels. They'll be elevated. Now, how do kids deal with that stress? They tune out. And now they're being diagnosed with this so-called disease. It does have a biological template in the brain because the biology of the brain develops in interaction with the environment. So sometimes medications can help, but they're not the answer. The answer is to change the atmosphere so kids can develop in a healthier way so they can feel safe. And when that happens, the brain will start developing in healthier ways. So ADHD is not this disease inherited otherwise. It's actually a response 
to stressful circumstances in this culture, despite the best efforts of parents. And the way to really deal with it is not to medicate these millions of kids and to try and just control their behaviors, but to try to understand what's happening for them. Very good. So, what I hope, so w with your book and my book, and this may sound like let, I let am me, a marketer. But, but wait, let me jump in here for a moment, if I may. In this society, that we make certain assumptions about human nature. And the assumption that we make is that human nature is competitive and aggressive and selfish and aggressive. Don't we just make that assumption? Whenever it does some, somebody does something selfish or aggressive or manipulative, what do we say? Oh, that's just human nature. But when somebody does something kind or generous or giving, do we say, oh, that's just human nature? So we make certain assumptions. But your book, which is actually designed for the entrepreneurial world, it's not about what's in it for me, it's about what's in it for them. And, and it's about building connections, which is actually human nature. We're wired for connection, you see? And we're, we're actually more wired for love than we are for selfishness, if our needs are met. And so, if you ask yourself this, anybody in this room, just ask yourself, when do you feel more at peace inside? When is your viscera, your guts and your heart and your lungs more expansive and more relaxed? when you've been selfish and aggressive and grasping, or when you've been kind and generous and connected to people? Well, the answer is going to be, in most of our cases, that it's under the second condition. That should tell you what human nature is actually all about. So your book here is actually an appeal to people's essential needs. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah. see, what, what I hope is I want to take the givers of the world yeah. to have them be better, less jaded, or not jaded, and better boundary givers. Because yeah. if you are a giver, you're going to have takers. You're going to, and yeah. I hope it can reach the takers of the world to get them to realize this is probably not the best uh, operating system. And I understand why people become takers, and to a degree, narcissists and sociopaths yeah. and psychopaths, and there's yeah. a lot of trauma uh, as a result of that for those people. And I think uh, your book will is just a course in how to be a more compassionate, caring, connected person. Because what I say is, you know, my book is disguised as a capability book, but it's really a character book. Yeah, yeah. And if people get develop the capabilities and they develop the compassion, they are going to be more connected uh, givers. But I say, if you're disconnected from yourself, it's really hard to go out and connect with other people. Because exactly. how do you develop relationships really authentically uh, if you f hate yourself, or if you're disconnected with yourself, or you have un all this pain internally and, and oftentimes externally, uh, and, and I think both of our books do really well together. They help each other, and because and, my whole thing is I, I just believe we can really build a better entrepreneur, and of course my goal with Genius Recovery is to, to change the global conversation about how people view and treat addicts with compassion instead of judgment, and find the best forms of treatment that have efficacy and share it with the world. So it's an educational platform, and you're one of the best educators in this particular area. So it's always uh, to my uh, interest and my goals to take you and share it with the world as much as we can, because it's, it's important, uh, it, it's, it's significant. And um, so like, I want to ask you this question uh, in front of everyone, just to kind of see your perspective off. Uh, I have a, a, a VR company called Genius X, and my yeah. co-founders are here in the room. And Deanne uh, Adamson, who you know, uh, she's got, we've got a course with her on addiction recovery, and I want to uh, do courses uh, on fantasy contamination, and meaning going past the fantasy, where what being someone in the VR world, what would happen if you changed the environment? And where this came from is you introduced me to uh, Dr. Bruce Alexander, who wrote yeah. The Globalization of Addiction. He's the one that originally did the, the Rat Park studies. And one of the things that my co-founders, we said, I said, there's so much tech that is doing destructive things. Yeah. You know, there's blood sports, there's gaming, there's yeah. gambling, there's yeah. distractibility. And, and we don't want people to live in the VR world. What we want is to be able to change the environment. And you can do that immersively 
and let people experience stuff. I would love to, and I would pay for it with you, just to develop a program with you in virtual reality, because we want to do it right, meaning people immersively, I think we can build a compassionate inquiry process in VR where people can literally hear Gabor talking to them. And, and I know that sounds crazy. Thank you, Joe. I'm really looking for more things to do in my life. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> that's actually funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Is this too narcissistic of me to have socks that say what's good for that? You know? <laughs> no, but, my, and by the way, I'm not saying you even need to be involved in it. I just oh, like okay. the, the, yes. the, the whole, the whole, you've already created it. You've already said it. I'm just saying another way to, like, got it, got one it. of the ways that you, um, you're, so, you're reaching so many people is you're out there. And, and by the way, most people don't know this. He was at a, you're at a very, you're in the middle of a big conference in, across the country right now. And he flew in last night just to come and do the interview here. And he has to fly out right after this, literally just to be here. So I want to just acknowledge you Thank for you. that. Because it's, it's, it's huge. And... Well, you're, you're not easy to say no to, let me put it that way. No, that, <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and plus, I, want, I, I, I just know that we, we help so many people. I mean, Absolutely. that was evidenced by the stuff that we've done. So, so the point is, there's a lot of different ways to uh, treat trauma, there's, to address depression, to address yeah. anxiety, and you have studied and document so many of them here, yeah. and the best people in the world that, that are helping others with it, you're personal friends with all of them, and, yeah. I, and I know a handful of them too. Yeah. So uh, for things that, uh, for everyone here that really, re how many of you just totally resonate with, his, with what Gabor is saying? I mean, you can just see yourself in what he's describing, yeah. Sir, you didn't put your hand up, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> the, well, no, I've been saying this as a joke, too. There's a lot of my, I, I said this uh, yesterday when I was talking to my friend Marie uh, Forleo, I was interviewing her, is that a lot of my uh, friends, some that I've introduced you to, that um, won't do the, the deep work uh, or, or have a fear or a wall to go in and do therapy or do a yeah. journey, uh, what they do instead is they start, <laughs> they start a podcast. Yeah. That explains all the podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> it, it really does. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. So you, you talk about stuff like medicine journeys and yeah. you talk about some that to, to a lot of people seem uh, incredibly extreme. Yeah. And, and, I'm a, and, and I'm very careful to go tell people to go do ayahuasca or MDMA or psilocybin because it's, it's not the medicine itself or what some people say is a drug. Yeah. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's as Timothy Leary said, I think, in the 50s, the set and setting, right? Yeah. And could you speak to that? Just because it's, it's become a trendy thing now, and, and there's people that are doing it well, and there's others that are putting people in dangerous situations. Yeah, so um, I do have one chapter out of 33 on psychedelics, which kind of puts it into perspective. Like, it's not the major thing of what I do. And right. uh, recently, I refused to write a blurb for a book. Uh, and I said, even this is the best book ever written in the history of the universe, I will not blurb this book because of the title. The title was... Oh, if psychedelics will save the world. I don't think anything is going to save the world. No, any, no one particular modality is going to save the world, or even the medical system. I think for that, we need transformations on a much larger level in our thinking and in, in, in our thinking and in our activity, in our institutions, and how we relate to each other. Nevertheless, psychedelics can make a contribution. And as you heard me speaking today, and Joe and I are conversing, so much of what drives our behaviors are unconscious patterns that we adopted in response to traumatic events in childhood. Mm -hmm. So that so much of what pushes us and drives us is not, we're not that aware of it. And so many of the mental health challenges, for example, or physical health challenges for that matter, that are um, plaguing us have to do with uh, childhood dynamics. So for example, depression, so, depression is this inherited biological illness. No, it ain't. You know how much evidence there is that depression is a biologically caused illness? Zero. That's how much evidence there is. And 
the fact that now I've taken antidepressants and they've helped me. But the fact that an antidepressant helped me doesn't prove, like the serotonin, which is the medication, uh, the, the brain chemical that the um, antidepressants elevate, like, like Prozac or, or Zoloft and so on. Okay, so that made me feel better. But that doesn't prove that my depression was caused by a lack of serotonin any more than if, you know, you go to a party and you're um, feeling very shy and you have one shot of bourbon and now you feel more sociable and you talk to people and you're more confident. Does that prove that your social shyness was caused by lack of bourbon in your brain? <laughs> you know, so we make these false uh, connections. Now, if you look at what depression actually is, what does it mean to depress something? It means to push it down. That's what it means. And what do people push down when they're depressed? Their emotions. Do they feel flat? Now, why would somebody push down their emotions? Because in childhood, it was too dangerous for them to experience them. Because their environment rejected them somehow if they experienced their emotions. So they pushed their emotions down in order to belong and to be accepted. And then 30 years later, they're diagnosed with this condition called depression. Now, you ask about psychedelics, whether we're talking about depression or addiction, um, <clears throat> or the self-induced stress that drives many of the autoimmune conditions out there. What the psychedelics do <coughs> is they temporarily remove the membrane between the conscious and the unconscious. And now you get to see all the rage and all the pain, all the fear that you've been carrying inside. But you get to see it in a safe environment, ideally. And by the way, not all environments are safe, and there's a lot of negative stuff that happens in the psychedelic world. We have to acknowledge that. But in a safe environment with the right guidance, now you get to see what's been driving you, no longer as the helpless, isolated child, but as an adult with the capacities of an adult, and you get to witness yourself, mm -hmm. guided and supported and kept safe. What a powerful experience that can be. And also, of course, under the impact of the psychedelics, people can have the experience of getting to know their true selves, the part that they got disconnected from a long, long time ago. So ideally, and in a very romanticized nutshell, that's what psychedelics can do. It's more complex than that, and it's never just, here it is, I know I've got it. I mean, believe me, I've done psychedelics, and I've, if you don't do the integrative work, if you don't, they just open the door for you. It's still up to you to go through that door, walk through that door, and walk that path in your actual life. You can't rely on that psychedelic experience. But a lot of people have found it transformative. They have made realizations about themselves that would have taken them a long time, if at all, to get to through ordinary psychotherapy. So they still have a role to play, and they've been shown uh, to play significant uh, potential positive roles in the treatment of PTSD, for example. Various, medi various medi medicines can do that on, in the right conditions. Um, people can overcome addictions. <coughs> people can just be closer to themselves. So that's the ideal, um, but realizable benefit of psychedelics. Very good, very good. And, and there's a great chapter in uh, The Myth of Normal on this, so thank you. Let me bring you into the world of, of ADHD, a world that I live in, obviously. Uh, I'm 71 years old. I've been living in it for 71 years, and uh, uh, I've, I've been treating, uh, by now, thousands of people who have it. I, I know this condition inside and out. And I'm here to tell you, the term is completely misleading. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a terrible term. Throw it away. Throw it away. We don't have a deficit of attention at all. If we did, it would be a form of dementia, which it's not. We have an abundance of attention. Our challenge is to control it. Our mind is going a mile a minute. You know, it's, it's, we've got a race car for a brain, a Ferrari for a brain. We have we have just so much attention. We're brimming with attention. Um, but the Ferrari engine that drives us has bicycle brakes. 
So our challenge is to control all this attention, to control this tremendous mental activity, um, not to suppress it, but to direct it. Uh, I make the analogy with Niagara Falls. It's just a lot of noise and mist until you build a hydroelectric plant, and then you can light up the state of New York. So I'm pretty much in the hydroelectric plant business. I take people with these uh, incredibly powerful Niagara Fall brains and help them build their hydroelectric plant. And, and you know, entrepreneurial activity is, is a really good example of a hydroelectric plant. Most entrepreneurs have this condition. So what, what is it? Well, it, it, the condition is a, is a collection of, of ways of being in the world. I, again, I don't see it as a disorder. I see it as a trait. And if you manage it right, it becomes a superpower. But if you don't, you see, the, the, it's high stakes. If you don't, you know, you live a life of underachievement, of frustration, worst case scenario, addiction, uh, incarceration, the prisons are way overrepresented with people with undiagnosed ADHD. So are the halls of the addicted, the unemployed, the people who can't stay in relationships, the, you know, the people who are getting in their own way time and again, self-sabotage and whatnot. It's, it's uh, undealt with, unrecognized. It can be holy hell living with this condition. But if you recognize it and, and learn how to you know, develop breaking power and learn how to you know, channel the tremendous power that you've got, then super success. I mean, you know, and, and uh, I could name you so many people who have it. Uh, in addition to your host, Joe Polish, uh, the man who founded JetBlue Airlines, David Nealman, big time ADD. And, you know, he went from JetBlue to found another airline, then another airline. Now he's finding yet a fourth airline. Um, and he invented the electronic ticket, by the way. And I think it's ironic that it's someone with this condition with ADHD who thinks of a way for us to go to the airport and not have to remember to bring our ticket. He also came up with the idea of putting television sets in the back of the, the seat in front of you because, you know, the ADHD boredom is kryptonite. And so he didn't want to be bored on flights. So he said, why not put a TV in? So suddenly, uh, you know, and, and that's David Nealman. Uh, uh, you've all heard of the PCR test for COVID. The PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. Well, the man who invented that, Kerry Mullis, he's now in heaven, but he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. It was one of the biggest advances right up there with double helix in terms of advances in chemistry. And, and he, has, he had flaming ADHD. Kerry Mullis was... Um, he, he, one of his favorite things to do was walk on the beach in Malibu with a penguin. I mean, he was a genuine eccentric fellow, as people with ADHD tend to be. So if you manage this right, the sky is the limit. You know, I'm mentioning sky, Richard Branson has it too, you know, so, so um, uh, you know, you're in really good company. But watch out, because the downside, as I pointed out, is, is also very real. Uh, probably the, the biggest uh, pothole in the road of ADHD is addiction. And uh, addiction is, is 10 times more common amongst us. And, and uh, uh, we're, we're basically self-medicating. And, it, and it's not just chemicals, it's behavioral addictions as well. But if you get your ADHD diagnosed, then it's a lot easier to uh, control, control the addiction. See, our greatest asset, is, and, and what sets us apart from Joe and Jill Normal, is our imagination. We have an extraordinary imagination and that can serve us or it can impede us. So let me explain a little bit more of, of what goes on in our, in our busy, busy brains. Uh, the condition is defined in the diagnostic manual in terms of three core symptoms, distractibility, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Uh, we are uh, we are remarkably distractible. We are remarkably impulsive, and we're hyperactive or very restless. Got to be moving. Well, you take each one of those supposed negative symptoms and turn it on its head, and you get a tremendous asset that you can't buy or teach. Uh, the the flip side of of distractibility is curiosity. We are unbelievably curious. We are driven by, by curiosity. Uh, the ADD brain is like a toddler on a picnic. It goes wherever curiosity leads it with no regard for danger or authority. Off into the lake, into the woods, stick your hand in a snake's nest. I mean, it, we are 
we are driven by curiosity. We will not sit still until we find out what's in there, what's over there. Well, that's what makes us distracted. We're distractible. Well, what's that? What's that? What's that? We we want to know. We're the opposite of, of lazy. We're the opposite of, you know, taking things as they come. We we are forever investigating. And that's why we're such great scientists and such great entrepreneurs and such great creators. You know, we noticed the Petri dish cha change since we left it. And, and next thing you know, we've, we've, we've discovered penicillin. So, you know, we, we are, we are, it, curiosity is our driving force. And, and, you know, and as I mentioned before, uh, boredom is, is our kryptonite. The, the minute we feel absence of stimulation, curiosity drives us off to find something else. Um, you know that that uh, that will that will engage us. You see, we we have to be engaged. We have to be stimulated. We can't deal with lack of stimulation. That's called boredom, and that's kryptonite. We repel from it. We re reflexively, we just can't stay. We can't stand that state. Like nature abhors a, a vacuum. Uh, ADHD abhors absence of stimulation, or called boredom. So that's distractibility. Okay, and again, you have these paired opposites, distractibility, curiosity. Uh, each negative has a paired positive. Impulsivity may be my favorite one. Impulsivity is what gets us all into trouble. Impulsive decision-making, reckless deal-making, impulsive romances, you know, impulsive actions, you know, danger-seeking behavior, all that. Impulsive. Well, let me ask you, what is creativity? but impulsivity gone right. You don't plan to have a new idea. You don't say it's 10 o'clock, time for my creative idea and lay it like an egg. No, uh, creative ideas pop. They come spontaneously, unbidden, unplanned in the midst of something else, completely not related. They come impulsively. If you tamp down all your impulses, you will not be creative. And those people who have what I call attention surplus disorder, they never have new ideas because they're, they're, they censor them before they reach consciousness. Their, their mind rejects them as being, you know, too new, too alien, you know, so, so it's the ultimate uh, conformist who's just, you know, but we are the ultimate nonconformist. We welcome the new idea. Now, nine out of 10 of them are useless, but one out of 10 wins you the Nobel prize, you know, so, so. Uh, our creativity and our impulsivity go hand in hand. And that, that's why you don't want to get rid of, you don't want to turn your, repress your impulsivity so much as you want to have breaking power. You want to be able to direct it and know when to shut up and when to speak up, you know, and, and that's hard for us because we, we tend to just, you know, we blurt things out. We, we you know, I, I used to, when I was dating, uh, I can't tell you how many women I asked to marry me on the first date. I'd say, well, we're having fun. Let's just make it last forever. And, and uh, now I've been married to my wife, Sue, for 33 years. So I'm not, I'm not in danger any longer of proposing marriage and, and the spur of the moment. But, but you know, uh, the, there, is a, there is in that also a tremendous positivity. We, are, we, we fall in love, if you will, pretty quickly with a with a deal with a with a with a project with an activity with a cause we, we we are prone to fall in love and and in a good way uh and that's that's part of our impulsivity if you will we are we are ready for action we're ready to <clears throat> give it our all we're ready to go for broke and and um and you know we're we're kind of innocent in that way and we're you know we're we people say well we should be more cautious well the best way to do that is to partner up with someone who's more cautious, because it's awfully hard for us to exercise that on our own. I've been trying for years to learn how to be more cautious, and I've not succeeded. But uh, but I have good friends and advisors <clears throat> who, who are naturally more cautious. Um, and then the, the third element of that triad, hyperactivity, uh, you get to be my age, I'm 71, it's called energy. I'm really glad I've got this little turbo pack on my, my back. You know, I, I was born with a, 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 a genetic, uh, uh, you know, extra charge of energy. And, and uh, it served me very well throughout my life, you know. And, and, uh, but, but once again, you know, it, 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 you can be out of control. Uh, uh, and, and so you need to learn 
to put the brakes on. You know, you, you have this runaway brain that's forever wanting to jump out of the corral. And, and, and so you have to, you have to learn how to, you know, to, to saddle it up and ride it. So, so it doesn't ride you. So it doesn't run away with you. And, and that's that, that's the challenge. Well, but it's, it's a very doable thing. So, so, uh, I'll mention one other quality, and then I want to get into management a little bit. But uh, our our sense of time, you know, we 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 don't have the same executive function skills that other people do. We're not uh, we're not detail oriented by nature. So so we have trouble sweating the details, planning, organizing, prioritizing, and it's particularly noticeable around time. Our our sense of time is fundamentally different. In our world, there are, there are basically only two times. There's now and there's not now. So you say the, the proposal is due on my desk uh, next Thursday. Not now, and it's just gone until not now is almost now, you know? And, and, and so we are forever getting things done in a panic at the very last minute. And, and uh, what we're doing, what happens in a panic is your body puts out a lot of adrenaline. So you're essentially self-medicating with adrenaline, uh, and it, and, it, it, and adrenaline is chemically very similar to the medications we use to treat ADHD, and and um, uh, it's uh, it, 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 you find and that's why you find a lot of people with ADHD drawn to very high stim uh, uh, professions: entrepreneur, uh, trader on the commodities exchange, trial attorney. Um, Navy SEALs, I've worked with them, and they, they're not allowed to take medication, but they say that doesn't matter because danger is their medication. And, uh, and that, that's exactly right. They get the, the adrenaline hit. Okay, so, so what do you do in, in terms of, uh, as I like to put it, unwrapping the gift or strengthening the brakes? And, and there are a number of steps. Um, the, most, the most commonly talked about one is medication, and then medication used properly is great. It, it, it operates like eyeglasses. It's effective about 80% of the time. In my case, it doesn't work. My medication is coffee, but 80% of people will respond very favorably to stimulant medication. Now, 20% won't. So, you know, it, it's not a, anywhere near 100%, but if, you, if it does work, it works like eyeglasses. It allows you to focus. Doesn't take away your creativity any more than eyeglasses do. In fact, it allows you to use your creativity with, with, with greater care and direction. Um, and, and, it, and it allows you to focus even when you're not super stimulated. So, so when the meds work, they, they can be really life-changing and, and take you from here to here in, in a short amount of time. But remember, they don't, they don't always work. Now, what else goes into unwrapping the gift or, or uh, learning how to, to direct the, the power of this brain? One of the most important ones, and I stress it in my new book, is, is finding your right difficult. Yeah, now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, it, it has to be the combination of difficult. See, if it's not challenging, we'll get bored. We, we love difficult, but it's got to be the right difficult. So it's also got to be in your wheelhouse. It's got to be something that that resonates with you. We're very mission driven, so appeals to the mission. Well, you know, for an entrepreneur, the mission is to grow something, to grow the business, and that's a big turn on. Um, and and it's you know it, it's it. By the way, it's growth that turns us on, not money. We like money, sure, who doesn't? But but it's really it's really that feeling of growing something that that's it's so exciting for us. So. So the, the right difficult and, and it, challenging, but in my case, I discovered my right difficult in 12th grade. It was writing. So, and, and writing is a, a very stern taskmaster. It's never as good as you want it to be, but I've written 21 books. And the reason is if I don't have a book going, I get depressed. So, you know, I finished ADHD 2.0. Now I'm on, I'm writing a novel, my next one. And, and um, you know, I, I have to have something going. And for you guys and ladies, uh, I, I'm, I'm virtually certain you have to have some deal cooking or project cooking or something you're working toward in order for you to feel right. So it's really important to find your right difficult. If, if, if you don't, you, you won't be at your, at your peak. Another real important um, uh, uh, step is to learn how to manage your dark side. Learn how to manage, most people with a tremendous imagination, which is really the hallmark of ADHD, 
have a dark side, have a side they maybe don't talk about, but they have a, a, a dark side where they brood and ruminate and get down on themselves and think they're a fraud, an imposter. Um, and, and by the way, that's when they're most likely to, to turn to drugs, you know, is, is to self-medicate the dark side. So you want to learn how to manage that dark side, obviously, without illicit drugs or behavioral addictions, like spending, shopping, sex, gambling, whatnot. Um, and, and, and the best way to do that, let me explain it to you, because we this is fresh out of new neuroscience. Turns out when you're doing something constructive, positive, uh, th uh, four different regions in your brain light up. And in aggregate, they're called the task positive network. And we can see this on fMRI and functional magnetic resonance imaging. We can see the, the imagination in action on fMRI, the TPN, the task positive network. Now, when the task is completed, when the deal is done, when the cake is baked, whatever it might happen to be, um, uh, the TPN shuts down. And what lights up instead is called the default mode network, the DMN, which I call the demon for the following reason. In those of us with ADHD, the demon, which is the seat of your imagination, instead of building castles in Spain, you know, it attacks you. It sends out this terrible onslaught of negative messages. You suck, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're boring. You're never going to do achieve your goal. You're never going to become the person you wish you could. All the other people are doing better than you. You're you're way behind in the race. You're you're never going to get there. You're and furthermore, you're ugly and boring. And just you just lay it on yourself. You just attack yourself viciously and horribly. One reason you keep in in that state is is contentment is too bland. You never say someone was riveted in contentment. But you do say they were riveted in self-hatred, in fear, in anxiety, in, in, in images of gloom and doom. So it's riveting and gripping. Remember, we're always looking for stimulation. And so we'll sit there in this dark, dark place for extended periods, unable to snap out of it. What's the treatment? And this is a terribly important insight because it's so common in, in highly creative people. The treatment is not medication. Medication really doesn't touch it. The treatment is so simple, but so difficult to enact sometimes. It's to shut off its oxygen supply. The DMN depends upon your feeding it with your attention. So you have to redirect your attention. And that's hard to do because I, like I told you, it's very gripping, painful, but gripping. So you have to rip it away, redirect your attention to something else. Go for a run, have a conversation with a friend, uh, blast loud music, uh, go out and chop down a tree. I mean, do, do something that will engage your imagination and shut off the, your attention uh, being directed to the, the default mode network, to the demon. That's, that's a, a tremendous life skill. If you can learn to do that, you basically will exorcise that, that demon. You will exorcise the power that the dark side has over you. No medication, just redirecting your attention. And the, the motto is don't feed the demon. And what we tend to feed it with is, is our attention. Don't feed the demon, redirect your attention. So you do not have to be living in fear and the grip of, of, the, of the dark side, which most, most highly creative people, most entrepreneurs have that. They tend not to talk about it because we tend to want to be positive and upbeat and a, but it does uh, haunt uh, uh, an, an awful lot of us. And, and if you'll just do what I just recommended, you'll be able to master that, to tame that. There's a whole chapter about it in ADHD 2.0 that I recommend to you. Um, I want to add one more element in terms of uh, uh, unwrapping the gift, and then I will stop and, and, and entertain your questions. And, and uh, that is the, the force of connection. Uh, we live in, in, in highly disconnected times. Uh, COVID certainly uh, threw a tremendous curveball into all of our lives, and, and, and people are, are separated um, uh, physically, and, and uh, the, the warring with each other over, over politics and, and positions and all that. And that's not good for us. That is not good for us. 
we really desperately need connection. So you guys coming together, for example, so good for you. You are extending your life by having this meeting, uh, just being with each other, sharing each other's energy. I call it the other vitamin C, vitamin connect. And it's way underappreciated in terms of how powerful it is. You know, loneliness, it, 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 social isolation, and most people don't know this, is as dangerous a risk factor for early death as cigarette smoking. Social isolation is as dangerous as cigarette smoking. And, and the beauty is social isolation, you can cure if you make a priority of doing it as you all have done by coming to the, the Genius Network meeting. But keep up with friends, uh, talk to people in the supermarket, don't walk around with your head down, glowering, glaring and glowering and feeding the DMN. Instead, try to look up, look outside. And, and uh, uh, I prescribe dogs. Dogs are the world's greatest provider of connection. Uh, get a dog. You know, it's no accident that God spelled backwards as dog. And, and um, you know, so prioritize friendship, prioritize dogs, prioritize uh, participating in causes, going to meetings. It's not enough to believe in something. Go to the meeting. Connect, you know, uh, really, and, and, and connection is really the source of pretty much the best of life. And disconnection is the source of pretty much the worst of life. So, so whenever you're, you know, feeling a little bit out of sorts, connect. One of my favorite mottos is never worry alone. It's fine to worry. It's good to worry. You solve problems. But when you worry alone, you tend to catastrophize and, 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 and uh, make things worse. When you worry with someone, you start into problem solving. Well, those are three uh, of, the, of the main methods uh, of helping you unwrap the gift. Basically, I hope you've identified with what I'm saying. I hope you can see it as a, as a real positive in your life as long as you manage it properly. And it does separate you from the pack because you know you you've got a you've got a special power, and it's just a matter of learning how to manage that special power and develop it, and you know hook up to your hydroelectric plant, find your right difficult, and then the the world is just an incredibly exciting venture for as long as we get to be here. You know, I was as I think about our time today. I want. I look at it that what I look at myself as as a, kind of an advocate for all of our people, as I'm one of them. Our people, meaning entrepreneurs with ADD, proudly who are uh, you know making their way in the world here. And as I was thinking that, I realized that you're one of our people too. And you may be, if I think of myself as an ambassador of our people, you, beyond all odds. You're one of our people who with, with ADHD, but also with dyslexia, who has not only managed to get by in life, but you have managed somehow to summit the academic pentathlon of getting to the top of a very demanding field in medicine, and on top of that, a specialty in medicine that allows you to be not just a doctor, but a psychiatrist, all things that require amazing focus and ability to read and comprehend. So you're living proof of you figured something out here. So I, I'm, it was just dawned on me as I was uh, thinking about our, your accomplishment here. Well, and, and Dean, honestly, I'm small potatoes compared to uh, some of the people who have these conditions. You know, it, it's just a myth that uh, ADHD and dyslexia uh, are, are disorders. They can be disorders. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. They, they can ruin your life if you don't know what's going on with them. Uh, the prison population is full of, of people in the, in the unemployed and the addicted. But but so are the halls of the, the gifted and the uh, supreme entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs have this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I often think we should re rename it the entrepreneur's trait. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll just name a couple just so you, I'll be more specific. David Nealman, who's become a friend of mine, he founded JetBlue Airlines. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and he's the guy who invented the electronic ticket. Mm -hmm. And the you know, typical ADD, it just came to him out of nowhere. And, and 
And it is ironic that it's someone who has ADD who, who thinks of a way for us to go to the airport and not have to remember to bring our ticket. Exactly. You know? yeah. And and uh, and he also, because, you know, we ADDers, we hate boredom. He mm -hmm. came up with the idea of putting televisions in the seat in front of you. Mm -hmm. So when you're on an airplane, you don't you don't get bored. You know, those are. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, of course, Branson uh, famously has ADD and goes to outer space and. Uh, uh, and it's not just men, women. Um, uh, the woman who who runs Indigo Books, uh, uh, Heather Reisman up in Canada, big time ADD. Uh, and and I'll add one more, just because it's so uh, appropriate to our time. Uh, the man who invented the polymerase chain reaction, the PCR test, that we're all getting our COVID tested. Uh, mm -hmm. Kerry Mullis won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Uh, for for inventing that he's since passed away but he was hugely add yeah. very eccentric um, uh, and uh, but obviously gifted so you know it it in what my life's mission is to free people from the the stigma shame and ignorance and i i, I just it just it was so appropriate i'm just going to read you if i might uh, uh -huh. a, a uh, email i got this morning I gave a talk this morning to a, a group of doctors and um, uh, the, the man who organized it sent me this email and, and I just, uh, so this is today. He says, I was the rambunctious child who got straight A's without studying or ever paying attention. My parents would say he's really smart, but he's all over the place. I was the kid who failed every time standardized test and was placed in remedial classes in middle and high school, but then moved up to the advanced classes in the first week of school. I was the freshman engineering student who became truly despondent after his first failed exam, convinced that he was stupid and incapable of earning an engineering degree. And then I learned about ADHD, read several of your books and realized that I was probably not a stupid imposter posing as a smart person after all. Well, now this guy is a, is a resident in surgery and he's got um, uh, prizes for his engineering projects. Um, and and he's you know going to change the world, but hmm. but had he not learned about ADHD, he was ready to cast himself onto the slag heap, which is what happens. I mean, all of you guys in Genius Network are you know shining examples of of how to turn it into gold, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, you're a minority. The the majority of people who have this condition still struggle, mm -hmm. and and sometimes it, it, extremely so. And, and it's largely because the public is still ignorant as to what this thing is. They think it's hyperactive little boys who are overturning tables in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And there's so, so, much much, yeah. so much more to it than that. I mean, it, it is, and the notion of it being called a deficit disorder is so misleading. We don't have a deficit of attention. We have an abundance of attention. Mm -hmm. Our challenge is to control it. You know, in the one of my favorite analogies, it's like we've got a Ferrari engine for a brain. We've got this incredibly powerful imagination that just never stops. It's constantly churning up new ideas, new projects, new thoughts, new images. And, and it's just 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 a incredibly powerful mind. But with the Ferrari engine for a brain, we've also got bicycle brakes. Uh -huh. We don't have the braking power to slow it down, to come in for a landing, to stop and to focus. And so and so, but, but I'm a brake specialist and, and, uh, you know, once you get some control, then the sky's the limit. And, now, and you said uh, something, uh, you and I and Joe were talking a little while ago and you had said something new that I hadn't heard you say that, cause I've heard you talk about the idea of the Ferrari engine with the bicycle brakes mm -hmm. and I get that, uh, but you were likening the the tools that you need the the uh the uh learnings or the approaches to mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. as harnessing like the hydro uh power plant of yes. harnessing the power of a waterfall yes the yes. waterfall is just untapped potential until you put a hydro converting uh, mechanism in place to turn it into yeah. power. Yeah. And no, I, that, I was, can you say I, more I, about that? Because that sure. was, I got that. And I want to explore that a little bit because it's, I think, a very like profound unlock for me. 
I'll Good. share with you what I've done since you shared it, but I want to hear you expand. Good, that. yeah. I, I, ADD, you think of Niagara Falls. Yes, uh, it's it's just a lot of noise and mist. I mean, Titanic noise and mist. Uh, you know, incredible yeah. noise and mist. But when you come right down to it, it's just a lot of noise and mist and water. Well, when you build a hydroelectric plant, then you can light up the state of New York. Yes. Uh, you captivate the power of the of Niagara Falls yeah. by building a hydroelectric plant, and then and then you light up the state of New York. And and mm. and I'm a hydroelectric plant contractor, you mm. know. And so my job is to help people find their hydroelectric plant. And and it really is true. We most of us have, you know, our buddy Dan Sullivan calls it your your unique ability. We have yes. something. That yeah. we can turn into power, electricity, value, yeah. Yeah. Um, and 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 a lot of people are stuck because they haven't found their hydroelectric plant, yeah. you know, and they're stuck doing something they're not, not meant to do. And yeah. you know, I say, don't give up. My gosh, we just got to find your hydroelectric plant, your place to plug in, so that all this, all these ideas and energy and stuff you've got going on can become can become productive. So. Here's where this has gone for me since we had that conversation, because I look at that, it's such an elegant visual, even if I've never seen the inner workings of a hydro plant, but I know that there's a series of gears and mechanisms in place that the water actually moves things into motion that right. carries the energy into somewhere that distributes it, right? right? It's right. captured and distributed right. through right. all these, uh, leverage is really what does that, right? And I look back, we all know early on that we're, uh, that we're different as, as entrepreneurs. We don't know, before we know the words ADD, we're being accused of underperforming or we're being, uh, you know, like one of your number one traits is unexplained underperformance. Exactly. And that's, uh, if I looked at my, my mother past uh, maybe almost eight years ago now, and I got the report cards that she had been storing away, you know, from my middle, uh, from my uh, elementary school and middle school. And I remember seeing them then, but I remember looking at them. Now the summary statement that sums it all up for me was, uh, Dean is able to achieve excellent results with what seems like little effort. Imagine if he applied himself. That's the the rallying cry that people who have that can only be people who have figured out uh, their rules and and mechanisms for doing things that seem so impossible to us. That right. what they're really saying is, if you were like me, right. you would be able to do right. You need to apply yourself and work harder. Right, right. And right. I I've been thinking about this. That I wonder if there's a uh, a loophole, a, 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 a workaround in this. Because when we're saying apply yourself, what they're really saying is you need to work harder. Is you need to buckle down, Buster, you know, like get control of yourself and do these things. But I'm wondering, I said this to Dan Sullivan, we had a great conversation about it, that is the freedom maybe in that separation of yourself and separating it to your self and yourself being your unique way of doing things that imagine if you applied your self, your unique way of doing things, not just worked harder like everybody else uh, contributes. And that's where I think that when, if I can surround myself with gears and levers and and funnels that create my surround myself with who's as as we've been calling them in the who not how um idea of thinking surrounding ourselves with support system that can take our ideas and take them out into the the um execution realm pretty yeah, excited I Oh, totally exciting. And it, and it is, you know, I have nothing against the work ethic. Everything gets better if you, with hard work, but right. uh, it, it is not the cure-all. And, and telling someone with ADD, which is what these poor kids get all day, night, all day long and all night long, t 
telling kids or an adult for that matter to try harder right is, is about as, it's about as helpful as telling someone who's nearsighted to squint harder <laughs> you know it it, it 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 misses the basic point yes that there's a better way a smarter way yeah you know it's one thing to work hard uh, maybe it's even better to work smart mm -hmm. you know and, and to find your your hydroelectric plant to build your i mean like your one of your brilliant insights is this whiskers versus cheese more cheese now that that's, that probably yeah. came to you in a few seconds yeah and yet and the power of that concept i i was i think about it now often and and uh when someone's pitching me something and i think god too much whiskers you know i mean right. you know and and you know you know yeah. you don't understand you know I, I want cheese i don't want whiskers and right. and you know that didn't come from your working hard Right. You didn't sit down and say, I've got to come up with a brilliant idea. I'm going to really work hard to come up with this brilliant idea. Right. You know, the brilliant ideas pop. Yeah. You know, and, and one of our one of our qualities that's considered pathological, it's part of the diagnostic manual, is impulsivity. Mm -hmm. Well, what is creativity but impulsivity gone right? You know, mm -hmm. you're coming up with that insight. That was impulsive. It was mm -hmm. outside the box. It was not, you weren't following directions. You were, mm -hmm. you know, you were off, you know, thinking, daydreaming and, right. and impulsively. So, so if anything, we, we should not work that hard because when we're drilling down and working hard, uh, we're, we're often excluding that part of our mind that really does contribute mm -hmm. to unique stuff like the, that insight you had. And, and that uh, insight probably came to me while I was daydreaming and I was supposed to be working hard on something. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's exactly and, and, right. You know, the, the trick is, you, of course, we don't want to encourage our kids or our employees to goof off, but mm -hmm. maybe we do. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, goofing off, uh, depending what you're doing when you're goofing off, Mm -hmm. is is where new ideas come from mm -hmm. uh you know and 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 we we just were so guilt tripped into feeling ashamed if we're not you know doing something that we've been told to do but but yes. the world is is improved not by people who are doing what they're told to do but by people who are not doing what they're told to do who are, who are going yeah. off on the path less traveled but yeah. i'll tell you a quick anecdote then i'll shut up because okay. i want you to talk but uh uh, some years ago, I was I was consulting to the Harvard Chemistry Department because they had some they had a suicide there, and one of the things I learned the Harvard Chemistry is the maybe the best department in the world, and they they have five Nobel Prize winners on the faculty, so they get every year applicants from around the world to to come to that department and be a postdoc or a grad student, and um, uh, every year. Uh, they arrive in Cambridge and the mandate is go into the lab and discover new knowledge. Well, one group runs into the lab, so excited to have all the resources of Harvard at, at their disposal, they're ready to blow up the building, whatever. The other group freezes up. They say, no, you've got to tell me what to do. I'll mm. do whatever you want. I'll wash your test tubes. I'll grade your papers. I'll, I'll stay up all night and watch your lab hum. It, those are the people who lost the capacity to innovate, to initiate, to dream, to play, uh, to innovate and oh. and uh, they look got really good at doing exactly what they're told to do but their imagination got castrated they they mm. lost their their unique ability they they lost their they're never going to win a nobel prize you know because mm -hmm. they're never going to go outside the box and mm -hmm. and um and that's why we should really take pride in in what we've got and not not feel you know that we just need to work harder I think in every in every role, there's that different uh, that sort of uh, distinction. Because what you, when you're describing that, I was thinking about how people, as entrepreneurs, we often will hire an assistant, and the the two different types of assistants, without really knowing it, are people who you give them an idea or you give them something that you uh, is kind of a mess and you want them to take it on and organize it and turn it into something. And for some people, that's what they love. They thrive on taking it and making it organized and turning it into a system, but then they don't want to continue to run that system. Yes. Or you get yes. the other side of that, where if you hand them a mess like that, 
they get this deer in the headlights look and they don't know what to do unless you tell them what needs to run. And so that was a big distinction for me, understanding whether people are process oriented, process managers, meaning they need to follow checklists or project oriented where they need to make checklists, but not follow them. Yes. And so I think that there's, it sounds like if, if I put this under this category of, you call it unwrapping the gifts of your entrepreneurial right. mind, that is so much of that self-discovery, self-awareness of understanding who you are and what your, your mode is, is that kind of uh, base camp one in your mind or how, how do you start to? Uh, oh, absolutely. Start to I mean, you know, I think it's like uh, marry the right person and find the right job, but make sure you're in a situation that favors your particular abilities to, to flourish and come mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. as opposed to being in a situation that does the opposite. A lot of folks with ADD are stuck in humdrum jobs and, and, and they're not doing well. It's not because they lack ambition or talent. They're just plugged into the wrong outlet. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with relationships. If you're with someone who is scolding and, and trying to change you into being Joe normal, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could, and I've seen people in relationships like this that go on and on and on, and it's just horrible. Mm -hmm. We're never going to be Joe or Jill normal. We're just mm -hmm. not. And, and we got to be with someone who encourages us to be Dean or Ned, you mm -hmm. know, uh, or Eunice or whoever, and, and, and then play, you see, that's the key word play. And, and people think of play as being trivial or superficial. No, it's not. My definition of play is anything that engages your imagination. I hope uh -huh. we're all playing together right now. Uh -huh. um, uh, play is is the highest activity of the human mind, in, in, uh -huh. in my opinion. And 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 and, he, and so you want to encourage that. Now, you play can be work. Like when I'm writing a book, I've written 21 books. When I'm writing a book, I'm at play, uh -huh. but it's disciplined, difficult play. Uh -huh. But it's still play because I don't know where I'm going. You know, and I don't know what's coming next, and I'm I'm innovating constantly, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and and so so, but but I've got to have a format and a structure to allow me to do that. If someone else were telling me, no, you should be cleaning out the garage, no, you should be straightening up your room, no, you, Fine. what are you doing writing a book? Yeah, people told me before I published my first book that you're never going to make any money that way. You better have a day job. You're never going to wow. be able to support yourself, and and. Um, uh, I actually took their advice and went to medical school. <laughs> My first goal was to be a doctor, but I, I thought I better have a day job. I mean, to be a writer, but I thought right. I better have a day job. So I became a doctor. Anyway, it, it's, uh, I just think uh, we need to understand the creative process better and, and respect the conditions that, that favor it so we can flourish. And, and in the new book, I, I try to stress the absolute importance of having found your creative outlet i call it in the book i call it find your right difficult mm -hmm. find find you know it's got to be difficult or we'll get bored yeah and it's got to match up with your talents so it's got to be the right difficult so find your right in my case it's writing mm -hmm. in your case it's uh, marketing uh, mm -hmm. coming up with new ideas uh, you're, you're a multi-talented guy like this whole thing, I look at it very similarly. Like if you take what you do at the core, if you take out the context that you're specifically a psychiatrist working with people, um, that is a good portion of what you do every day is meeting with, uh, with patients and helping them out. But when you look at it, that it's a very fulfilling thing for you because you're a diagnostician. You're hearing the story, you're talking through, you're helping people discover, you're uncovering the formulas or the strengths or the way that they, helping them with your incredible vast experience to propose something that you've seen work um, other in other situations. And then the next day, it's a new person, and you're going through that same process. It's ever 
exciting or in you know it's uh challenging intellectually to uncover the puzzle right Similar. And that's exactly that's exactly what you do in your consultations. That's what I was just going to say. That it's the yeah. same, and so with that's what I'm excited about having you uh, when we're going to do a more cheese less whiskers episode as well to break down how similar those things are because I look at that as the my hydroelectric plant. That yes, all I do is talk, and when we record everything I say and transcribe it, it's now digitized and everything that we can do from that. It's an asset in that we've got somebody can listen to that particular episode uh, in perpetuity at any time. So now I've got hundreds of episodes. We, Joe and I have almost 400 episodes of, of I Love Marketing. We've got uh, all of this stuff that can be transcribed, all the articles, like I send out three emails a week that all are from that, uh, that stream of, of uh, ideas that I've put into the digital world. Joe sends out three emails a week, all from the same, uh, the same model. It's such that that's like the mechanism of harnessing these ideas and turning them into something that can uh, reach a lot of people without any more effort on your part. Yeah, and, and I think you're, that's your hydroelectric plant, and it, yeah. it's, it's magnificent. I, I would I would say it's not true. All you do is talk because <laughs> mechanically speaking think, I mean, thinking thinking yeah right right to talking right yeah <laughs> so you're not a wind-up toy that's pre-programmed to say the same stuff you're no. you're constantly innovating in your your brain you're you've yeah. got an amazing brain that's constantly innovating and then and then you're lucky enough that you're articulate you're able to turn it into words and that's the fastest i find the fastest bandwidth way to get something out of my mind into a digital format is through my mouth, is talking, is the fastest thing, faster than writing, faster yeah. than any other thing. It's almost as the speed of thought, as I'm thinking it, saying it, this is being turned into digital format. So we when we say anything um, you know, that we wanna be able to say again, if we say something that we've never said before, we've captured it right here and we can turn it into an, a non-fungible token. We might be creating magic here today. Ned. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you, you and Socrates. You know, that's what he did. He just walked <laughs> around. He just walked around talking. You know, and, and that's uh, so great. You know, it, it's a uh, it's with a scribe. Yeah, yeah. And people listened and wrote it down. And uh, uh, Epictetus, another one of my favorites. That's what he did too. You know, and 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 you know there is this amazing oral tradition and now with our technology we're able to preserve it far more obviously far more effectively and yeah. permanently yeah. than ever before in history and when people deplore modern technology i think now wait a minute wait a minute it, it may be it may be a, a bugaboo but it's also probably our defining greatest achievement of the past you know 20 years mm -hmm. is what we what we've done with this technology how has it changed for you? If we were talking about ADHD 2.0, is that we're as we're moving into a different level of the world, like your when was driven to distraction? 1994? Was that very good, Dean? Wow, that, yeah. I'm impressed. Yes, 1994, okay. long okay. time ago. Yeah, it's because I remember reading it well before it was uh, before the internet was the thing yeah. when reading was actually a, de a delightful distraction from the real world, right? I read so much more back then because there was nothing else to distract me from the primary distraction of reading books and magazines. Yes. Now, what I notice has changed is the internet, of course, has gone on this you know, exponential uh, path that started right after that book came out. Uh, that the internet kind of came on, but I look at the pivotal shift as 2007 when the iPhone came out and all of a sudden 
the internet wasn't somewhere that we went to escape the real world as a distraction. The internet was among us. It was it was uh, becoming now enveloping, and I really feel like we've gotten to the point where Cloudlandia is the real world, and the the real mainland is. We have to pull ourselves away to find time to distract ourselves in the mainland. As how has that changed the the way that you uh, think about things, or the way that because you've you've seen it all happen. You were still talking about screen sucking back then. Yeah, screen sucking exactly. It, it, that was a book called Crazy Busy. That is yeah. how I met Joe. Actually, it was yeah. uh, Crazy Busy. It was around two thousand seven, and and. Um, you know, I talked about screen sucking, where where we become we suck on screens the way we we might suck on a drug or you know a breast or what have mm -hmm. you, and and, uh, and we become latched onto these screens. But at the same time, you know, I I I I, I'm, I don't want to be someone wringing his hands. I'm just saying we need to learn how to use it so it doesn't use us. Mm -hmm. you know, because uh, if if you allow uh, Cloudlandia, you know, to become your ally and to become your you know your your best friend and you use it then we can you know this is add heaven today's world this is add right. paradise we 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 have constant access to everything you know it it, yeah. it becomes a huge playpen and and yeah. and people forget that sometimes because, because they want to they, they get so negative but as long as you're in charge, as long as you retain control, as long as you don't become addicted to the cloud, addicted to the information, addicted to the games, and instead you 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 let it serve you, then it's like we're more powerful than ever. We can yeah. run businesses, we can run empires, we can create all. Look at what you all, you and Joe, look at what you've created. Look at us together here right now. Yes, yes. All dependent upon that, and and it's a magnificent symphony of of ideas and and you know. It only becomes a problem when you allow all of that to replace what I call the human moment, to replace face-to-face mm. uh, -face relationships. You know, it's hard. It's hard to make love in the cloud. You know, you you, you can you can have you can have images and and all that and cyber sex and whatnot, but but <laughs> the 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 actual act requires your physical presence. Yeah. And and you know, falling in love really does require at some point your physical presence and. You know, the best thing I've ever done in my life with my wife is have our three children, and and uh, they're now 32, 29, and 26, and it feels like yesterday they were nine, six, and three. You know, and mm -hmm. and uh, and and thank God I, you know, I didn't get so wrapped up in my career that I didn't make time for, for that. So long answer, but I think again, if you manage it instead of it managing you, life has never been better. I mean, this yeah. is this is a we're, this is a child's garden of, of paradise. You know, we are, we, and we are, we're like kids in a candy store. You watch someone with ADD mm -hmm. and if people say all he wants to do is play, well, he's, his enthusiasm for video games is translatable into his enthusiasm for something else. Yes. You know, and as soon as he meets a Dean Jackson, you know, he's off starting a business, you know. Mm -hmm. I love it. And that's something that, uh, you know, I, I'm really, we've been talking, um, you know, among in strategic coach, we've been talking about this idea of who, not how, as the uh, thing where this is the ultimate connection device that we've got connection to everybody that we could possibly need at our fingertips to be able to support us and create that hydro mechanism for us. Um, so it's uh, you know, such optimism for uh, for moving forward. You know, if you can. I, I just want to comment on a comment that flashed uh, on the screen. One of you all said, "Actually, you can fall in love online," and I agree uh -huh. with that. I, I I misspoke. You you can, and I, I think of I fell in love with Shakespeare when I was in high school, and I, I've never met Shakespeare, but I fell in love with you know his his writing, and so yes, you can. You can fall in love uh, without meeting the person in person. Uh, I, I take that back. It's just a, it's a little bit different. And you someone else is saying, I, I, I met that. my wife. I met my wife online. A lot of people meet their spouses online. Yeah, we can't have a baby. Maybe that's correct. It. You can't do that. 
<laughs> Something. I don't know. You, you can arrange maybe, to have a baby. <laughs> maybe you can. Maybe you can. Who knows? That's exactly it. So where, I, I you know, I, I want to, um, I could talk like this uh, forever. This is so exciting because you and I could be like, I love your phrase of two toddlers at a picnic. We could just go yes. and explore all these things. Yes. But I want to make sure my uh, I want to make sure that we're going to direct the conversation to the things that you have that you want to present or prepare uh, or share with people. And my also priority is that I promise Eunice on every one of these that I'm going to go through and there's certain things that we need to address. So I always have my Eunice list here in front so we can make sure that we're uh, well, let, let's get to the Eunice list. On all can, the can I do a can I can I just make a comment and, and ask a really quick question before we get to the Eunice list which is much sure. better than, but uh, Dr. Hallowell it's like when you talk about this Ferrari brain it's almost like we hope that we have ADA or we're ADHD it's like oh darn I'm not like Dean. I'm not like Dr. Hallow. I'm not like Joe. Should we feel that way? Absolutely. You know, <laughs> I gave I, I I gave a talk at my old high school. I went to Exeter, which is a prep school up in New Hampshire, a very rigorous prep school. I gave a talk to the student body about ADD. And when it was over, the principal of the school came up to me and said, Well, Ned, that was that was very good, but you came perilously close to saying people ought to wish they had it. And I said, not perilously close. That's exactly what I want them to do. Uh, I, I want them to have ADD envy. I, I want them to mm -hmm. say, gosh, I wish I had that special power. Because the downside of ADD, you can correct. But the upside, you can't buy and you can't teach. Mm. You can't buy and teach entrepreneurial flair, entrepreneurial t tenacity, grit, uh, imagination. Uh, you know, you, you can't. You, you can try. But and you can take courses on entrepreneurship, but but there's a there's an X factor that you just got to be born with, and that's the that's the that's what the, this condition conveys. That's why the deficit disorder model is so misleading. Yes, I I when I meet someone, they say they have ADD. I say great, or someone says, oh, I think my kid might have ADD. What I say, why are you sounding so downcast? That's wonderful. We'll unwrap mm -hmm. his gift or her gift. So yes, indeed, I I. I truly would not trade my ADHD for the world. And the same goes for dyslexia. Timothy, would you- The, the, only, residual, I'm saying, the only residual problem with dyslexia for me is I'm an incredibly slow reader. Mm. It takes me forever to get, my wife says, I don't know how you know anything. It takes <laughs> me so long to, to read, but I can do it. You know, like I majored in English at Harvard and graduated with high honors mm -hmm. while doing pre-med. So I'm able to jump through those hoops but you know, I'm not a. I'm a very slow reader. That's the residual of dyslexia. But with the, you see another thing with dyslexia, people dyslexics tend to be very creative. You know, and like Winston Churchill uh, had dyslexia. Uh, so I I was speaking to a group of entrepreneurs yesterday about the annual event coming up, and I read a bio that I wrote on you. It's shorter than the bio that I read at the beginning of this session. And, and one of their responses was, wow, I'm glad that was a short bio because I'm so attention deficit, you know, so I like that. And I can hardly wait to hear what Dr. Hallowell has to say at the annual event was the response. Sure. Um, so, you know, so, so my question is not, uh, how, what percentage of entrepreneurs, if you were, I mean, you, you can do that through all of your experience, what percentage do you estimate are ADD? Well, what, what I believe um, is a, it's a much higher percentage than people who know they have it. Mm. Okay, so if you want to talk about what percentage know they have it, maybe 40 or 50%. Yeah. And that's maybe optimistic. But I think what percentage actually have it, I'd say 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 I almost think like it's an, an, uh, an entrance requirement. <laughs> mm. <laughs> because the things that, we have to do, entrepreneurs have to do, uh, define ADD, you know, think on your feet, be creative, change quickly, um, you know, be amazingly resilient, uh, come up with new ideas, fix problems there's no fix for, uh, you know, come up with hope where there's no hope, 
you know, pull yourself up in the middle of the, you know, the darkest night you've ever had. I mean, that that's ADD people are used to doing that because they've been doing it all along, mm -hmm. you know, turn, turn lemons into lemonade. And, and um, uh, you can't teach that. You can give lectures about it and you can sermonize about, you know, never give up and all this kind of stuff. But, but that's who we are. We just don't give up. It just, you know, and it's in our DNA. And, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's most entrepreneurs I know. And, and so, you know, I would say 80%. And, and, the, and, and another thing that I get passionate about is I want them to know it because once they know it, they can, they can, you know, make a better hydroelectric plant. You know, they, they can, uh, they can uh, make, they can get more done with less effort if they employ the techniques for, for handling ADHD. Mm -hmm. And everybody could probably, I mean, these, well, that's these true. You know, what, what, things that you're saying are not just for uh, people no, with ADHD. No. Exactly. Well, let's share a couple of, you know, if people say, what do you classroom management? Well, whatever is good for ADD is good for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just that we, we really need it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, yeah. we really need structure. We, we really need encouragement. We really need, uh, you know, the, the freedom to create and innovate. What, what are a couple of your favorite, like, go-to strategies that somebody could use to, uh, to help feel? Well, help remember, what way. works for me won't work for you necessarily, but, okay. but certainly have a creative, follow your creative outlet. If, if I don't have a book going, I get depressed. Mm. You know, so, so, and I've, I've learned that. And, and, and so, and I think most of us are like that. If, if most on, if you don't have a project in motion or several projects, mm -hmm. in motion, you feel stopped up, you just don't feel right. You feel, you know, just out of sorts a little bit. So honor the creative imperative. And that don't, that doesn't mean you're a workaholic or these negative terms. It means you've got to be creating in order to be at your best. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you neglect your family. It doesn't mean you don't go to church or whatever. It just means that you've got to, your mind has got to be engaged. Your imagination has to light up mm -hmm. or you're just not going to be at your best. So that's probably, probably number one is, is to find your hydroelectric plant, to find your, mm -hmm. find your creative outlet and, and really honor it and respect it. Um, uh, you know, then the other one is obvious, uh, marry the right person, be with the right job. I don't mean you have to marry, but be with the right person and find the right job. Uh, and a lot of people, it's, it's you know, they, they miss the fundamental. That's, they make the, once you engage with the wrong person or sign up for the wrong job, you, you're, you're going to short circuit your abilities and you're not yeah. going to become all that you can be. And, and then there, and then there are, are, uh, you know, I really stress the importance of, of maintaining a very robustly connected life. And I don't mean access to the internet. That's where mm -hmm. having a, a memberships and groups that you care about. That's why the Genius Network is so empowering. Mm -hmm. You're feeding off of each other's energy. It's not just the ideas. If it was just mm -hmm. the ideas, you could send a, a printout every week. Mm -hmm. But there's something about coming together and the energy in the room where you, where you feel really rejuvenated. I call it the other vitamin C, vitamin connect. Mm -hmm. and, and the world is starving for vitamin C these days. And when you mm -hmm. have your big meetings together, you just feed off of each other. It, it's, a, it's a force that we haven't learned to measure yet, but it is very real. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's what teamwork is all about. That's what, you know, um, and that's why people thrive on teams, you know, when, when, and when you put your energy to each, so connect would be another major tip that I would uh, cultivate connection, um, mm -hmm. cultivate friendship, cultivate, now don't have too many connections because then, it, then the connections can become a burden. Mm -hmm. I talk about, uh, uh, you know, cultivate lilies and get rid of leeches. Mm -hmm. Leeches are people or projects that just aren't worth it. Yes. And, and so if you can get rid of a leech, boy, you'll do yourself a huge favor. That's but at the same time, cultivate lilies. Lilies are people or projects that are worth the time you put in. And, and yeah. my, the three biggest lilies are my kids. They took a ton of work and money. Uh, but my gosh, were they ever worth it? You mm -hmm. know, uh, but you be careful because we're so we're so life enthusiastic. We can have too many lilies. And then the lilies begin to feel like leeches. So mm -hmm. make sure you don't overcrowd your garden with too many lilies. So, but 
but get rid of leeches. Oh my God, get rid of leeches. And, Those and lilies, that, I think like that metaphor can apply to projects or- Oh, yes. Or everything is that- Yes, yes, yes. Like your, your, your whisker cheese, that's yeah. a lily of an idea. Yeah. You know, that, that you know- and, Which and, gives, uh, you know, there's something about the, uh, what that allows me to do is it creates a context that allows me to have a fixed thing that the eight profit activators, for instance, as a framework, and this model that now I can get variety in that by bringing in different uh, businesses, just like you've got your uh, all of the tools and all the, the ways to diagnose and help people uh, unwrap their, their gift. And you, the input that changes is the new people coming in. One of the things that I've, I've discovered was I'm calling it my, your power verbs, right? Like my, my power positions kind of thing. If I think about what I actually do, um, and setting myself up in those things that are, when I'm at my best, what am I actually doing? And so often that's on the phone recording something, whether it's a podcast, a consultation, a, um, a you know one on one with somebody or recording uh, for the purpose of recording something, a conversation is one of my uh, power moves. Another of my power moves is sitting on my in my uh, reading room, in my comfy chair, or on the white sofa in my courtyard with my remarkable tablet and hatching evil schemes, doing a thinking, brainstorming, writing, thinking about uh, trying to solve a problem or applying something that, uh, that I need to do, brainstorming, outlining, something that I can then record. Uh, is is that part of my hydro plant that makes it all uh, work? Now, what I've discovered... and that's that's a beautiful description of play. Mm -hmm. you, you're and, sitting you're sitting there like a kid making mud pies. You're, yes. you're playing. Yeah. And what I've discovered is that my brain doesn't care as much what particularly i'm thinking about it no about exactly whatever's exactly. in front of it as long and as it's I, engaging as long yes. as it's stimulating yeah if i if i have as long as i i muster the um, adult level sort of supervision of setting myself up what you as one of the biggest impacts on my uh life was a conversation that you and i had maybe 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I don't know, whenever we first kind of met, you you introduced me to this idea of you can go through your day like a toddler at a picnic and just wander around and go wherever your mind takes you. Or you can set up borders and a direction and zip through it like a bobsled run. And yeah. that to me was like so amazing because I often think about time like that. I often imagine that it's this bobsled run and I visualize that track that I get on the bobsled run and we're moving at the pace of 60 seconds per minute and 60 minutes per hour and 24 hours per day. It's constantly moving at that. And I envision almost like guitar hero things that are coming at me and when they're going to arrive. And it's a really interesting thing to fit things into those uh, times like playing Tetris, where you have this lots of things that are coming at me and I can establish them when I'm going to uh, do them. And But realize you said something two weeks ago when we talked that that I've been using about lead generate, lead conversion, that there's only two time frames now and not now. And you said to me, you know, I just wrote that in the in the book about that people with ADT only experience two time frames. Yes, yes. Now yes. and it, not it, now. It, it, in our world, in the world of ADD, we have a fundamentally different sense of time. We we don't have the 
linear sense of time most people have in our world there are two times now and not now yeah so you say the paper is due next thursday not now and it's just gone until exactly until not now is almost now and then yeah. we get it done in a panic you know yeah there was a great uh tiktok meme going around where it's someone talking to themselves or you know are you going to do that and they go uh i'm gonna do it later and they go, yeah, but if you do it now, you won't have to do it later. Exactly. And they go, yeah, <laughs> but if I don't do it now, I don't do it. And I do it later. And they go, yeah, this is just, just funny, saying, but... hence, hence procrastination. And that's exactly yes. right. That's why we're, we're so, so prone to procrastination. And then at the last minute, what happens in a panic you get a good big burst of adrenaline and adrenaline yes. is chemically very similar to the stimulant medications we use to treat ADD. So you're basically self-medicating with panic, self-medicating with adrenaline by Ooh, procrastination. Wow. That's a very interesting thought. I'd heard uh, Joe Rogan, I think was a talking about how, you know, we, we medicate for removing that feeling of stress and, he joked that that's how the rent gets paid. That's how things, that's a valuable, useful thing in our lives to spur us into action. Yes. And if, if our, yeah. if our ancestors a, had access to it. No, absolutely. I, stress is one of those words, again, mm -hmm. uh, like so many things, there's an upside and a downside. The upside of stress, what I call good stress, that's what drives excellence lifting yeah. weights editing your manuscript you know yeah. working under a deadline yeah. that stress is, is is like depression paranoia backbiting gossip uh you know people who are you know, you know just out to hurt hurt people and that's bad stress yeah um you know but good stress is you know striving and and you know trying to get it done and and uh, uh you know negotiating and and all the kind of stuff that uh uh, you know, allows us to achieve big goals. I love it. Well, do we have, um, what I'd love to do, Ned, is is open up and see, maybe Timothy can help us here. Uh, I know Timothy's got to run too, so Gina also could help us with some of the questions that people are um Did we do Eunice's list? Here. Yeah, we're, this is, uh, let me, I'm going to double check and we'll do that okay. while... Timothy, have you been monitoring the chat, Timothy? I have, and Gina actually has a list, so Gina's going to okay, be great. sharing the questions with you. Yes. Well, all right. So our first question so far, you guys feel free to post your questions in the chat or raise your hand on Zoom, and we'll we'll call on you. But Dean Anthony, his power went out too, Dean, and his name is also Dean, and he's back on. He had a question. What's the best way to find the person to keep an ADHD um, on track? And uh, Dean, do you even want to come and ask your question? On track and focused, and he's thinking maybe it's a better half, maybe you need a good wife, maybe an RH person, somebody who's super organized. Um, so that's, that's what he's looking for, the best way to find that person to help keep him on track. Well, you know, you, you multimodal approach is the answer because there's a lot of things you can do from medication to exercise to structure, but a coach can make a world of difference. And it's very hard for your spouse to be your coach because the nag factor gets in the way. It, it, it's why it's hard for your parent to be your coach. The nag factor gets in the way. So a coach is someone you hire, you pay. Mm -hmm to ride herd on the details, to ride herd on the stuff that you tend to overlook, forget, mm -hmm. procrastinate, put off. And, and a coach can be worth his or her weight in gold. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the name of the single best coach in the world. She is without doubt the best coach in the world. I have referred hundreds of people to her. She is, she's the, the ADD whisperer in my opinion. Um, uh, she is just, uh, she just has magic in her, in her, in her, in her methods. And, uh, uh, her name is Jen Zobel Bieber and, uh, her website is Jen at jzbcoaching.com. Hmm. And, and she's incredible. Now there are, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of coaches out there. And 
There's a coach academy that trains coaches. If you Google ADHD coaches, uh, that's one way. You can go to Coach Academy. That's the name of it, coachacademy.com, mm -hmm. I think. I think. Um, a coach, the right coach can make a huge difference. The wrong coach is just glorified secretary. I mean, it's a waste of time and money. Mm. But the right coach, the person who really gets you, David Nealman, who I referred to earlier, his administrative assistant has been coaching him for 40 years. I mean, the, the, which he would be lost without her. Uh, he, she basically knows when to tell him to go to the bathroom. I mean, she's, she's got everything. And so he, he can just go and be himself. Mm -hmm. and she'll pick she'll pick up the pieces mm -hmm. and and so so that if you can have someone like that in your life uh whether it's your admin assistant or a coach or just don't have it be your 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 partner i've been working with a uh service called commit action for the last uh eight weeks or so about maybe three months now i've been doing this and i talk with my coach once a week and we look at the uh, calendar and we've got the projects and things that I'm working on that I want to commit to getting done this week. And we put them in the calendar uh, as to when I'm going to actually uh, do them. And then we get back together on the phone next week and we move those things um, in. And just that level of accountability. I've been working on it with, you know, a couple of projects that I've been, I don't have it, we don't go through my entire week and, you know, uh, organize everything, but I really want to get these particular couple of projects uh, done. And so I've been scheduling those times with, uh, with them. And it's, it makes a big difference because it, it likes, just like you were saying, Ned, that, you know, the only things we see are now and not now. It, it's almost like you're, you're time traveling. And, you know, the most reliable form of time travel is to travel into the future and cordon off the area where you want to uh, do something and have it prepared for when you get there. And it's now you look at the uh, calendar and I had cordoned off 2.30 on Wednesday to be here with you. And I don't know about you, but I never miss things that I've put in my calendar that are involving other people. Uh, absolutely. And you see, and that you, you referred earlier to the toddler and the bobsled ride. The, the toddler way, the toddler on a picnic is just driven by curiosity with no regard for danger or authority. So that's you playing on your, your pad there. Mm -hmm. you're, you're a toddler on a picnic. You're going wherever curiosity leads you. Mm -hmm. Now, the other mode, which is also incredibly valuable, is the, the uh, bobsled mode. And mm -hmm. that's when you impose structure. Mm -hmm. So having a time to meet or having a, a, an order of things you're supposed to do. Structure, mm -hmm. then you're zipping forward. You, you, mm -hmm. There's no getting waylaid. There's no wandering off into other places. There's no room for curiosity to take you off the ride. Because uh, with structure, then you you get maximum forward progress, mm -hmm. you know, and you tick off goals. So you you want to have both of those modes mm -hmm. at your disposal: the toddler mode and the bobsled mode. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're filling things, when you're filling it with things that you fundamentally want to do. Right, like you're saying about writing the book is play. You don't right. mind the writing the book; it's just the. Um, sitting down to actually write the book and right. getting, you know, putting that time aside. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful. So if you want to get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here. And if you want to watch some more videos that will be useful and awesome, click here. Go ahead. You're over here. Do it now. Come on. Thank you. Watch them.